everyone, I'm Hannah Lloyd. And I'm Charlotte Gilfillan. Welcome to our podcast, Women in Wellies. Each episode, we will be inviting a guest to share their stories, experiences and lessons of working and living in rural Scotland. We want to get to know the real women behind the wellies and share them with you, our listeners. This episode is sponsored by the Landed Estates and Rural Business Team at Henderson Loggy Chartered Accountants. Hello and welcome to episode 17 of the Women in Wellies podcast. This week we are joined by Mary Bowman. Mary, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. I'm very flattered to be asked. Um, I'm very good, thank you. Good, it's great to have you. You've been on my been on my list since we started. You were one of the early ones that we were like, Mary would be a great conversation. So it's great to be here and having this conversation. Can you kick us off, Mary, by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? I'm Mary Bowman. I'm an Associate Director at Highland Rural, which is a relatively new and relatively small rural surveying firm based in Dingwall Auction Mart. Um, I live in Nairn, but I'm from Edinburgh originally, and I've lived in various different parts of the Highlands over the last 14 years, working in various land-based roles before settling up here around about five years ago. Five years in the Highlands, I'm jealous. Um, Can you tell us, Mary, how you kind of ended up going from Edinburgh into the rural sector in the first place? Because having grown up in Edinburgh, I know that not everyone transitions to work in the rural sector. So what drew you to rural and, and how did you kind of get into it in the first place? Do you know, it's funny, I was thinking the exact same thing. Normally when I tell this story anywhere else, it's like such a unique story, but I'm actually in very good company here because... <laughs> I'm sitting with Charlotte, who's had a very similar career path to me, and Hannah, who is also one of the few people that chose to move from Edinburgh to the Highlands. Um, But yeah, great minds and all that. Um, So I always just had an obsession with rural Scotland. Um, We did actually, we grew up about 11 miles outside of Edinburgh and moved into the city centre when I was eight. And I'd already sort of like begged my parents for horse riding lessons, all that sort of thing. So I had a bit of a rural love already. Um, Our family have always holidayed in Ardnamarkin. Um, And then when we moved into central Edinburgh, my grandparents retired out there and I, I, yeah, I loved Edinburgh, but I also, I just absolutely loved out being out there and staying with them in Arden American. So every single school holiday, um, yeah, every opportunity was spent out there. Um, and then the summer I was 15, I went and got a job in the local hotel up there and lived in a caravan. And then <laughs> at the end of summer, uh, I turned 16 and made a very bizarre, rebellious decision that I was not going back home from Arden American. Um, so I actually, I went to the local school and did my last year of school there um, because my grandparents lived about an hour and a half away from the school, I qualified to stay in the hostel. So I went from a uh, school in the centre of Edinburgh to one in the middle of nowhere, I think it's fair to say, um, with, God, probably not even a tenth of the amount of pupils. Um, so that was kind of my first foray into rural life. Um, and then after school, I just kind of, I knew that that was where I wanted to be, but not really sure how do I make a life for myself there. So it was actually at the Highland Show. I'd gone back to Edinburgh to see mum and dad, um, and walking through the SRUC tent and thought, ah, an NC in agriculture, that'll do. So signed up for that. And then same again, just wanted to be back in Ardnamark and every holiday from college. Um, and then I got my lambing placement on the local estate. Um, so did that. And again, uh, I was slightly rebellious child in a bizarre way. Uh, realized after the allowing placement that I'd actually done enough of the course already to not have to go back so that was it again I was back in North American and refusing to go home um so I started working on the estate there and I did a summer with the shepherds and then at the end of the summer again didn't want to go anywhere else so got some work with the deer stalkers um and that was brilliant I started off in the larder um which also was a funny experience because I'd been vegetarian for pretty much my whole life up until about a year before then 
Mm-hmm. But I think what actually converted me was moving to the hostel in Arden American. There was like two choices on the dinner menu at night time. And a lot of the time there wasn't a vegetarian one. And I thought, I'm already the weird kid from Edinburgh here. If I come in here and say there has to be a vegetarian thing on the menu every single night, nobody's going to be my friend. That's amazing, though. But nothing like like putting yourself out your comfort zone, like being moving somewhere and then being like, right, I've just got to make a decision. I've got to, I can't be, I can't be any weirder than I already am. <laughs> like, here we go. <laughs> Do you know? I mean, I'll admit there was a few chippy, uh, cheeky McDonald's and chippies here and there before that. But yeah, that was definitely my kind of like first experience of properly cooked meat. Yes, yeah, so I started working um, in the larder on the estate and then wanted to learn a bit more about um, how the deer got there, basically. So I started gillying and helping out driving the Argo um, and did that for a season and I just remember thinking I can't actually believe that people get paid to do this for a living like I've got some incredible memories from that summer of like sitting on the top of a hill just basically waiting for the stalker who was at the front with the guest and just sitting there in the sunshine looking across to the Isle of Mull being like I'm being paid to do this this is incredible <laughs> um so yeah that was it after that I had the way there was a student there at the time from Thurso College so I'd spoken to him heard about the college course I was like this is what I'm going to do um but yeah for various reasons Arden American wasn't the right place for me to do that so I started basically just trying to learn more about the estate landscape in Scotland like this is having Arden American being my only experience of that up until that point so I had no idea what other estates and opportunities were out there um and I actually rather than researching the estates first I probably should should have done my research with the college first to find out that they actually did a sort of thing where they assigned you a placement because I was under the impression that I had to find a placement before um before I got a place in college so uh, that was when I went on the internet and just started googling shooting estate Scotland um, and wrote down the name of every single one I could find and every single telephone number I could find um, yeah and phoned around a lot of them he must have been like answering the phone like uh, <laughs> uh, yeah what like why are you phoning us like so bold to just kind of make those calls though and like when you're what 17 18 Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is, at the time, I really wasn't that fussed because I didn't know any of these people and really didn't know that I necessarily would know any of these people in my future life. Um, But yeah, the funny part of that was actually my mum and dad just left Edinburgh recently. So I was helping them clear out their house a few weeks ago and they found that list, which I assumed must have been torn up and in the bin somewhere. Um, But yeah, so now, however many years later, reading that back again um nobody else will ever get to see that because I'm absolutely mortified about some of the people who I now know to be like estate owners and other people that I work with who at some point I phoned up saying I had absolutely no experience but I would like a job please (laughs) hopefully they didn't write your name down on a system that they can now google search and be like oh yeah (laughs) yeah fingers crossed they don't find like yeah their notes somewhere of it yeah that's amazing so then college, presumably you went, did you go to gamekeeping college? Yes. Yeah. So that, um, yeah, that, that exercise didn't actually lead to a placement, but it did lead to someone who said the estate I own can't give you, you know, we don't have enough work for a student, but we can give you a six month job in the meantime. So that was on a deer farm and training, they trained Highland ponies there as well um, for driving and for carrying deer which turned out to be really helpful because then I got a placement on an estate up in Sutherland um, where they still used your ponies. So that was brilliant. Um, I did a year there and again, just some of the most incredible experiences thinking back to that now. Um, and I went to college, so it was the block, block release course in Thurso. So um, yeah, barely went south of Inverness for a year, um, which is quite funny. but. Um, yeah, did a year at the college and I was the only female in the course, which you won't be surprised to know. Um, I gather the kind of, there's been a 
bigger uptake over recent years and there's been quite a lot more females gone through the college which is great news but at that point in time I think it was generally only one per year but I was actually I was very lucky um they they took two students on that estate so the other student was also the female from the year above me so we had a really great time (laughs) yeah that is brilliant that was college and then did a year but got an opportunity for a full-time job after that so I went down to Deeside and worked at Balmoral which was brilliant and that was specifically um, breeding and training highland ponies for the hill um, rather than kind of you know doing the more stalking side of things so that was another really incredible experience Um yeah just like going back to Edinburgh my parents were just like what on earth is going on here <laughs> having having seen me like float off at 16 being like yeah no I'm just moving here not quite sure what I'm doing yet to uh, yeah mum really enjoyed telling everyone that her daughter worked for the royal family now so um but no that was an incredible I was there for a few years um but yeah that was kind of very horse focused and I've always loved horses but I don't love horses, if you know what I mean. I think there's a fine line that a lot of people in the rural world are very aware of. Um, And whilst I was, you know, I was getting a lot of exposure to the hill and we were training the horses for stalking, um, I realised that was a pretty niche career and I pigeonholed myself a little bit. Very easy to go from that then into an equine role, but yeah, that was where I hit a bit of a standstill, I guess. Um, and yeah another story I left out of the previous employment was uh, at the time I cracked my hip out on a day's stalking oh no that sound that like just everything about that sounds painful like <laughs> and like a massive inconvenience out on the hill <laughs> oh god yeah so it was like uh I can't even yeah quite a trip to get back to the estate office and then getting back to the estate office it was another two hours um in the back of an ambulance down to Rigmore and they actually said they'd never seen someone consume so much gas and air before um but yeah they also told me that they were going to cut my Harkula Pro Hunter trousers off me which uh, I was like no give me the gas and air and just yeah they don't need cut off the hip will be fine um, like, my trousers are worth more than my hip no <laughs> yeah pretty much um that's quite crazy and then at what point did you make the transition did something happen that made you think I don't want to be in this I want to move into management or like how did you make that transition what kind of changed or happened for you so yeah, it was it was a combination of things. Um, I, yeah, I had some time off work after my hip, and yeah, spent that time writing um risk assessments as a bit of a punishment because I was riding a hill pony when I probably shouldn't have been when it happened. Um, so that was fair enough. But yeah, it took a bit of time off work, but I thought it had pretty much healed. And then when I went into the job after that, um, as anyone that's got horses knows, you spend a lot of time shoveling and throwing things into the back of buggies. And yeah, my hip just started kind of, um, that was getting a bit worse. I realized that I probably wasn't going to be able to do a physical job forever. I was also just, you know, I was always someone that was kind of, you can probably tell from what I've just told you on to the next thing what's happening next um and then I think speaking to yeah I think I spoke to some other people that had also you know were kind of involved in the stalking world whether that was their partners um or you know their parents and then they'd gone on to do management um and that really kind of inspired me to do that um so yep that was the point I decided I was going to go to uni and study rural business management and yeah try to get into the management side of things. Mary you've gone from being I'm assuming in a tied house full-time income working and making this decision that essentially you wanted to leave the comfort of all that and go to uni what was that like for you? That was a big challenge and a massive decision to make. Um, you know, the comfort that you have in a tied house and you're able to live in a spot where you generally would not have been able to otherwise. Um, so I think how I was going to fund that, 
and also not necessarily knowing that I had a job at the end of it or that anyone was going to employ me was um, a big decision to make. But yeah, I um, moved over to Pitlochry and commuted from there, was living with a partner at the time, which helped. And then when circumstances changed with that, that was when I guess I was completely like, how am I going to get myself through the last few years of uni? Um, and after a few mental breakdowns, I just started speaking to friends about it and turned out, yeah, more people are willing to help than you would think. So I actually house sat for a friend for quite a while until I kind of, yeah, got myself back on my feet, I guess. Um, and yeah, found a flatmate to live with. So that is, you know, most people have the experience if they go through uni of their flatmate, um, their yeah housemates, which is one thing that I guess I didn't have going to the kind of rural world. But I did get a short six months in Pitlochry where I lived with a guy that I worked with part time. Um, and yeah, and then after that, I actually did an internship for my first rural surveying job in my last summer, uh, sorry, the summer before my last year of uni. So moved up to Inverness doing that and they offered me a job upon leaving, but obviously I still had one more year to go. So ad lib work through my final year as well, which was great. So my final year of university was also a massive challenge. Um, by that point, I'd actually also agreed to work for somebody else part time. So I was working two different jobs in Inverness whilst also having to be in Edinburgh for uni one or two days a week. Um, I know why I want to be your friend. And it's because you and I are both the same people that are like, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that on the side. <laughs> like, you're like, ah. <laughs> and then you look around and you're like, how did I end up saying yes to all these things? <laughs> I know, yeah, no, I'm terrible for it. I'd say yes to everything, but uh... I don't think that's a bad thing, though. And I think that just hearing your story and just your tenacity at, at a very young age as well, and your kind of determination to succeed, you speak very passionately about being at Ardna Merkin, and obviously that's inspired this great love, I think, for rural Scotland and how you could carve a life out of that and carve a career out of that and um it really speaks to your determination that even in the face of those challenges you knew what you wanted to do you were on a path that you wanted to take and you kept going and you found a way to do it I think that's brilliant thank you yeah it's funny you, you look back and you remember all the good bits but um yeah there was a lot of tears as well but yeah I'm quite happy to forget about those bits and remember all the good bits because there was plenty um yeah it was an amazing experience um I remember when I was keeper in, and I got made redundant and I was working two jobs and I was working a couple of days at the firm where I first started out and just trying to juggle all those things financially support yourself but know that this is what you wanted to do this was your niche this is what this is the career you wanted the opportunity you wanted to take and just trying to get that balance right between because at the end of the day you've got nobody else to rely on apart from yourself and you have to be able to financially support yourself um and i think as well it's i kind of get the impression from you you are fiercely independent I am independent in a lot of ways, which I suppose probably comes from leaving home at a young age. But I have also leaned heavily on a lot of people along the way that friends, family, colleagues, employers, um, in terms of both advice and opportunities. So I suppose it's probably worth highlighting that it hasn't all been fiercely independent, um, which I'm very grateful for. You have met and worked with some phenomenal people throughout your career is there anybody that has particularly inspired you um so yeah it's really hard to fit it to one kind of person or thing um it's changed a lot kind of over the course of my career um at the beginning just in the introduction to the rural world I was just amazed by anyone basically you know farmers I think what they do is incredible stalkers I couldn't believe that people actually hunted things for a living um you know 
just basically anyone who was kind of living and working in the rural world I was always inspired by um and then as it kind of moved more into surveying um there was just a lot yeah a lot of people that I've worked with um have really inspired me over time you know whether that's just because they're incredibly good at their job or the way that they handle certain things or the life that they've managed life and careers that they've managed to build for themselves um and then I suppose now as I am kind of getting involved in some quite big and exciting projects about with work I'm really inspired by the opportunities that are there for rural Scotland and particularly the Highlands um I think you know the kind of changes in market that we're seeing the sort of carbon the renewable energy and don't get me wrong those things have their downfalls as well um but you know there's kind of opportunities for new income streams and are seeing sort of farms particularly with battery storage where it takes up a small um footprint on the farm but you know it has relatively good financial returns and that enables them to diversify and do other things on the farm um I'm just very excited about thinking about what the Highlands could look like in 10 years time and the sort of the better job opportunities in some of the more rural areas and just kind of seeing that develop is what's sort of inspiring me to keep turning up at work on a daily basis. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, what it's going to look like in 10 years is completely different to what it looks like now. We look at some of the larger opportunities like Scotland, like the free ports um, and the the jobs that's going to generate and the houses that's hopefully going to generate. Um, and it is it's going to look like a completely different landscape in 10 years time. And you're right, there are some, you know, there are some pitfalls in there and there's very much a balance to be achieved. Um, but there is so much opportunity at the moment. And I think the Highlands is the place to be. I'm absolutely convinced of this. I couldn't agree more. And yeah, when I have like, when friends come up and stay, because a lot of my friends went down to London um, and, you know, a lot are still in Edinburgh and the Central Belt, um, which you know, in itself, I think it's absolutely brilliant living where I live because I'm 10 minutes from the airport and I can fly down and see them at the weekend. So you've got the kind of best of both worlds. But I feel like every time they do come here and visit, they see more and more the attraction of living in, living in the Highlands where, I mean, we have everything up here now that you need. Don't get me wrong. There's more selection of nice places to eat and places to go out. And that's the sort of thing that I get excited about when I go to a bigger city. But I also feel like that's coming up here um but yeah I just think you know you can live near the sea near the woods near the town just have all of that at your fingertips it's brilliant you've had some phenomenal practical experience on the ground experience how has that helped you professionally now that you're a surveyor um it has helped a lot um so I'm sure you can imagine well you, you guys will know one of the questions you get asked all the time is where are you from because everyone in rural Scotland knows someone in every other part of rural Scotland. So I always feel a bit, hmm, when I have to say Edinburgh. So, you know, people immediately assume, which Hannah will know fine well, that you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Um, so to be honest, I probably tell the story of where I got to now more often than I'd like to, because I feel I have to go Edinburgh, but I've also lived in various parts of the Highlands for the last 15 years. Um, but yeah, actually having that experience um, has helped me a lot, uh, a lot along the way. Um, yeah, I think I've heard you mention it too before, Charlotte, it is that kind of instant respect that you get from people when they realise that you were actually out there on the hills working. Um, and whilst having a background in rural Scotland would be massively beneficial to me I'm sure you know I think sometimes even actually having done that sort of the on the ground part of it is maybe even more beneficial than being from rural Scotland but just coming straight out of university and going into the job so um sometimes I look back and kind of kick myself that I didn't do the normal thing and go to uni straight straight out of school because you know I was there a lot later I was classed as a ma mature student much to my disgust um but actually I'm so so glad that I took the path that I did because by the time I actually went you know I really knew what I wanted to do um and wasn't just sort of in a course because my parents had made me do it or whatever so 
yeah, I can look back and think, God, it took me a really long time to get where I am. And I'm at the same sort of, you know, I've done the same years of professional experience of pe- as people that are a lot younger than me. But no, I'm really glad I did it the way I did it because that experience was extremely valuable to what I do now. There's just one thing that springs to mind and it's what Hannah and I have talked about before is no wrong path. There is no wrong path to where you want to be. And although in terms of professional experience, you may be on par with some younger people, there is no accounting for that life experience. There really isn't. And I think it's such a fundamental part of being able to understand your job more understand people more appreciate people more and and people who do these jobs on the ground who are keepers who are farmers and be able to relate to them and I think that adds so much value to the work that we do for clients um but also just being able to build those relationships because let's be honest people are 90 percent of the work that we do yeah no you're so right you're so right do you still manage to enjoy rural Scotland outside of work as well? Yes, yeah, I'll admit I don't travel around Scotland quite as much as I used to outside of work just because I am doing that so frequently in work. Um but yeah, I I love Nairn for that. I've got the beach on my doorstep, so I'm there a lot and enjoy like Hannah swimming in the sea. Uh, I mean, I'm saying I'm like Hannah, but I also you know, it's it's July to August is my kind of swimming season. <laughs> so thanks, Mary, for sharing all your story. We end every um, episode by asking our guests the same question, which is what one piece of advice would you give to the next generation of rural women in Scotland? What's yours? So, I mean, I suppose what bit of advice would I give to the next generation is basically what bit of advice would I have given to myself when I started out? Um and there's literally too many things to name, uh, too many things I wish I could have told my younger self. Um, but I think the main one I would say is just be good to yourself. Um, I mean, you guys said, you know, you, my journey sounded like I was determined and I was, but you can also be too determined sometimes um, and just put yourself through, you know, unnecessary hardship. So I'm a real fan now of knowing when to say no um yeah drinking the wine when you need to drink the wine and eating the chocolate when you need to eat the chocolate um just taking that time out as well because I think as well if you're too busy worrying about the next thing and being too harsh on yourself you forget to actually stop and enjoy the moments and I have had some really incredible experiences um going from Edinburgh to where I am today um But yeah, I perhaps didn't enjoy those as much as I might have had I just remembered to stop and breathe sometimes. So I think that's really really solid advice for the next generation, but also really solid advice for all of us as we run through, you know, like it's always on to the next thing, looking ahead, what's happening next, what's the next thing to project to win or the next client to work for or the next whatever actually just remembering to pause and enjoy the moments enjoy the landscapes that we get to live work and play in as part of rural Scotland and the highlands and everything that goes with that is so important and I think you know that's probably for me one of the reasons why I stop and take a selfie when I'm out and about and it's because it's a moment to just pause and be like look at this landscape that I'm like driving through rushing between meetings or whatever that whatever that looks like and I think that's such good advice for all of us to just stop and smell the roses or (laughs) you know admire the landscape agreed selfie not obligatory though you don't have to do that far (laughs) no (laughs) if you do send them to me because I love them so mary thanks so much for joining us to share your stories experiences and lessons that's a pleasure thank you so much for having me if you'd like to connect with mary on social media her details are in the show notes below thanks for listening if you enjoyed this episode follow us on instagram at women and wellies podcast to stay up to date with all the latest news and you can email us with any questions on womeninwelliespodcast at gmail.com and we'd love it if you leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time.